You are now watching Believe. Do you believe? Welcome in, everybody. Ethan here. Mike here. And welcome to the Blue Note Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things St. Louis Blues. It is episode number 16. It's the We Went Blues episode. Mr. Brett Hall. Can't go with anybody else other than Mr. Brett Hall. I mean, no way. I don't think there's any way you can do that. Um, No. The best goal scorer in the history of the franchise, and that probably won't change anytime soon. So no doubt about it. Uh, Before we get into it, like to thank all the listeners out there. Mind hit that subscribe button, little plus button, wherever it may be, so you don't miss a single show. Give a five star rating if you love what we're doing. Leave us a comment. Get involved with the conversation over on Twitter at TBN Pod and share the podcast on social media so uh, Blues fans can find us as well. And then normally we would shift over to the Central Division, but we're going to skip that tonight and uh, focus on the Blues notes because there's a lot to talk about. I think this is. We're, we're we're approaching a fan base divided scenario here, and yeah. um, I even think that we're going to have some differing opinions on some things. As well, which I think is good for the show. Yes, but um, I mean, yeah, it's it's very bizarre start to the offseason. I think there is there, there's an element of everybody calm down. There's still a lot of time. But there's also an element of what else are they going to do? So uh, right. I think that's kind of where we go, and we'll start here with the uh, with the the pretty much the move that everybody agrees on i would say with robert thomas yep eight years 8.125 million dollars per season starting the 20 uh next season here right yeah next season yeah so 22 23 um i i love this extension you know robert thomas is absolutely a player who is going to be a cornerstone piece here of your franchise moving forward one hell of a stud player And so getting him at just a hair over $8 million, not bad. I I think here looking down the line, you're going to look at that as one of the best, best bargain deals for a premier centerman across the entire NHL. Eight years, yes, I get it. It is, you know, it's a large commitment here to him, but he's only 23. Just, Just lock him down. Lock them down here at this point. I don't foresee even a single reason why, if Armstrong needed to, that he could not move this contract. If, if again, for any sort of reason, he would want to. Yeah, I think there's three things with this for me. Um, number one is the cap's going to go up, so mm-hmm. that's going to help this deal. Number two is all these casual NHL fans who don't know who Robert Thomas is or don't pay attention. He's going to be the first line center in the future. He's one of the best passers in the league. Like we have saw that last season. You could ask any analytics guy. They will tell you Robert Thomas is one of the best passers. He might have been the best passer in the NHL last season. Right. So 57 uh, assists last season. Finally started to shoot the puck. Has an underrated shot. You got to think he's only going to get more confident having 20 goals last season. Mm-hmm. Um, and eight-year term is nothing when you're 23 years old. So like he's going to be 31 when this is – or 32 when this is up because it does start – uh, in 2023, 24. So I, I think that now I think you kind of shift to like, number one, are they going to extend Jordan Cairo? And number two, is it going to be a bridge deal? Because I don't think that they're going to commit eight years to Cairo, which I, I don't, I think the big thing with Thomas is I think they're expecting him to turn into more of a two way center with mm-hmm. already the offensive ability. Mm-hmm. I don't think Robert Thomas's defensive ability is exactly where it needs to be right now, um, but I think he can get there. And I think that's a big reason why they were comfortable committing. The thing with Kyrou is like, he's pretty much what he's going to be, which is he's a really good player, but he's pretty much there. Like I don't see a 30 goal season probably is the only big change you're going to see from him, which would be great. But I'm very curious to see what they do with the next Kyrou deal. And I wonder if they wait until next summer when he's an RFA and then you're, I think yeah. you're kind of in the offer sheet danger zone next season with Cairo if you hold until the summer. So that's a bit of a concern, but I think that's where you got to look next because Stephen Ground wrote this article like three months ago in March on the hockeywriters.com. And we'll shout him out later because I have a, a little tweet at the end of this that he, that he posted, but the priority next summer is Thomas Cairo O'Reilly. They already got Thomas. I'm sure they're going to talk to Cairo and try to figure something out. I don't think mm-hmm. it'll be done that soon it doesn't feel like it i'd be surprised if it was and then o'reilly which i don't think i think if it doesn't get done this summer he's gonna hit the free agent market so uh but that was you you got step one down i think out of those three to extend i think thomas was the most important in terms of getting the eight-year commitment done 
and out of the way. Um, and if O'Reilly does depart in free agency next year, here's your next captain, I think. Unless you, unless they go Braden Shin, I think that's the only other option other than Robert Thomas. Shin, I think, would be the, the logical choice if you were to, to talk captaincy at this point. But, um, I mean, and again, just to kind of put a, a bow here on this, Robert Thomas, I mean, what do you think? He's, he's what, this next, this generation's Nick Backstrom? He's this generation's Claude Giroux? I mean, I mean, you are talking about a top five center in the NHL here at the at very, very soon, if not right now. Um, it's it's such a good extension here at this point, and and I have no qualms here with it. Yeah, he got he got more than Josh Norris, who's the comparable. He's a way better player than he is, and he got uh, a little bit more than Jack Hughes, who. Yeah. I think Jack Hughes could end up having the better career between the two, but Robert Thomas has been way more productive in his career. Now, I, Jack Hughes is playing, has not been on a Devils team that's been any good in his entire career. So that's a bit of a change here. Like Thomas's numbers definitely helped that the Blues were as good as they were this year for Thomas's numbers. But like you could always see it with him. Like there was always something there. Like we saw it in 19 during the cup run. He got hurt a couple of times, but you could always see that there's something there. So. And I think a, actually a perfect example of that is the Maroons game seven goal. Like Thomas makes that play. And uh, yeah, so this is a great deal. Uh, this is really the only deal everybody agrees on. Cause now we go to one where it's kind of all hell breaking loose. This is a polarizing one here. And I think before we kind of get into this, I think we should agree to shake hands. We're going to have our agree, our, our own opinions here about this and be able to put on our uh, professional hat and our fan hat. Here yeah. at this point. So uh Mr. Nick Letty, four years, four million dollars. I'm gonna open up to you here first. I want you to be able to get first opinions here out. Okay, so I think a four-year contract for Letty is absurd. Uh, he's 31 years old. He's had a couple horrible seasons before getting to the Blues. Now, I will say I liked what he brought brought to the lineup when he was here uh, mm -hmm. for the half the season. Mm -hmm. But you can't – he's a better player. He's always been a better player and a better fit here than Scandella. But yes. you can't ignore the fact that Scandella was just awful after they extended him. Like, you can't ignore that here. Now, I don't think it's going to be the same, but I hate the four-year deal. Uh, four million – I guess I – I didn't love the four million at first, but then it's like Ben Shiraka, four point one seven five. So what the hell is that? So mm -hmm. I, I'm fine with that. But then again, you have eight hundred left-handed defensemen. So I'm going to be extremely <laughs> annoyed if they trade Perunovic or Krug. I'm going to be extremely annoyed. Like this is big for Letty because they chose Letty over re-signing Perron. Pretty much, essentially, is what happened here. They prioritized the defense, which they needed to do the whole time. But I just don't know if he's the answer. I think you're paying a lot of money for mediocrity on your defensive core right now because the only guy that I will trust is Justin Falk, and I the second guy is Tory Krug, who I trust as well, but uh, not as much as Falk. And and I, I I'm going to be very annoyed if they trade Krug. I, I don't want that to happen this summer. You got to get rid of the Scandella contract. There's got to be a way to get rid of it. Uh, the only problem there is the fact that they gave. Scandella a no trade clause of any kind is absurd and mm -hmm. this kind of shows like the the weakness of Doug Armstrong it's not a huge weakness but he's not great at signing contracts like contracts have been a bit of an issue it's hard especially in a cap world like this but man he's such a better trader and drafter than he is on the on the market and and uh some of the contracts they have right now which we'll get into later is an example of that and um, I, like I said, if they get rid of Scandella, I'll feel much better about this move. But yeah, I feel like you could have done two years, four mil, and everybody would have been much more okay with it. So that's, I'm not saying Letty's a bad player. His analytics are horrendous, but I think he's a good skater. And I think he bring, he does bring something to this team that, that they need next to Pareko. Um, so I think you're going to see him next to Pareko. And the ideal left side for me right now, despite the fact they have Mikula and Rosen kind of just sitting there, is Krug with Falk, Letty with Pareko, and Prunovich with Bortuzzo. But I also get the feeling, like, are they going to go 11-7 to start the season? Because, like, do you want Mikula to just sit there at 1.9 mil? Like, that's yeah. a, like they're expecting him to play. Yeah. Uh, which makes me wonder, like, are they going to trade Prunovich or Krug? Which I, I can't – We 
that that if if that happens the next episode after that i'm gonna lose my mind so oh the it's it's gonna be a large uproar and if you remember back to our conversation with peter harling he, he was obviously not calling him the next kel mccarr but you have to think that he is a kel mccarr light at this version so if you are talking about trading a guy here like scott perunovich and i even wrote an article like the blues need to be very very cautious about trading scott perunovich if you're going to trade him, you had better get a King's Ransom for this player. You absolutely need to. Now, again, I hope that they don't. But if it were to come to that situation, they absolutely need to get a haul for him. Yeah, I don't think they'll trade Prunovich. I think it's more likely they trade Krug. It's yeah. still going to piss me off. Like, I don't want to trade Krug at all. I think he's still got another year here at least. He plays well with Falk, and I just think you got to get rid of Scandella in any way you can, even yeah. if you have to retain a little bit. I don't care. That's how bad of a player he is. So uh, I, I don't think I I don't hate the Letty contract, but I don't like it as much as I think you probably do. But I, I'm not criticizing Letty the player as much as I'm criticizing the term and the idea that the idea that this defense is going to be fairly mediocre, and their top four is making. Three of them are making 6.5, and the other one's making four. Yeah. There's only one guy, maybe two, you could argue, that are worth 6.5 right now. I think Krug is right on the line. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I don't want to do the quick math there of how much 6.5 times three is. But if I had to guess, I'm going to say 19.5. Is that right? I believe so. So 23.5 so, for your top. Somewhere. Four. We'll, we'll call it an, an even 20 mil. You're, You're basically investing $20 million into three guys. And then, yeah, Letty now is 24 mil to your top four. And that top four is not that good. It's very – like, it's not even middle of the road. I think it's a little bit – like, I think it's in the 20, 18 to 22 range in the league. Like, that's just not – that's not good enough. With the way they play, like, on paper, it looks fine because your top pairing of Krug and Falk's pretty good. But Pareko's completely up and down. And, like, what do you – like, why is Scandella still on this team? That's, like, the big question. Like, why is he on this team? It, it, buy him out. I know. I know they it, don't buy guys out, but Jesus, he's terrible. No, they they don't need to be able to buy him out. I mean, especially when every single dollar is going to count here for this team here moving forward. They, the Blues cannot afford to buy them out. And, and I think we'll get into this here a little bit later. But looking here towards the future, if they're able to buy out a guy here like Marco Scandella, that's just going to handicap them here even more. And they can't yeah. afford to be able to do that. I I don't I don't mind the Nick Letty contract. And I will tell you the biggest reason why his contract is a cascading one starting out at $5 million here in this first season, 4.5 in year two, 3.5 in year three and three in year four. The thing, one of the things I don't care for is that he has a full no trade clause here in years one through three and a 16 team modified no trade clause here in year four that matches Marco Scandella here as well. So if you look at it, I mean, the two terms and the two contracts are very similar here between Letty and Scandella. However, you also have to look at who was available to bring in, because if you look at it, Letty was the best left-handed defenseman that was out there. Doug Armstrong and company already knew what they were getting here in Nick Letty. He brought stability here to the core, just like you said. He did look really good, but as a small sample size. But if you look at it here again, with and without Nick Letty in the, in the lineup, and Blues fans are very, very quick to forget on how much they were clamoring for Nick Letty to get back into the lineup and on how fast that they loved Nick Letty in this lineup. The ability to transition and zone exits and zone entries, it was unparalleled with any other defenseman that they saw here come into this lineup. So I don't dislike it. I'm pretty okay with it, especially here again towards the very end where his contract, the actual amount just decreases and decreases and becomes a little bit easier to move should they need to move on here from him. I fully agree with you. I don't understand why Marco Scandella is still on this team. It has to be the fact that no teams want to either touch him here right now or Doug Armstrong is just holding out to hopefully get something better in return than a seventh round draft pick. And which at that point, I'd say, thank you very much. 
please move on here from this contract because they've got to move on from it. And they just do a Vegas, like Vegas gave away Max Pacioretty for nothing. Yeah. And we can't give away Marco Scandella for nothing. Now, how many teams is his trade clause? No trade uh, clause? 16, I believe. Let me confirm. That's a problem. That, like, why? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Seven. He submits a seven-team no trade list. Either way, him having a 17. no trade list is a problem. So, like, Army hands this stuff out, hands these no trade clauses out like it's crack. Like, he won't give out a no movement clause, but he'll give out tons of no trade clauses. Like, how many players – okay, you have the first five defensemen have no trade clauses. Tarasenko, Shin, Buchnevich, and Saad have no trade clauses. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of those contracts were handed out within, like, the last five years, and they all have no trade clauses. Yeah. Like it is, I he's got to stop. But you got to think like, do you think teams like Montreal or Seattle or other teams that are willing to take salary are, you know, on that list? Because when did he submit it? He usually whenever a a no trade list is needing to be submitted it's usually from from what i'm aware of it's usually july 1st so it was before free agency then at this point now because they shifted free agency that date may have shifted along with it but typically speaking from what i'm aware of it's usually july 1st if the canadians were able to get a trade out of the jeff petrie contract then i mean you gotta there's gotta be some sort of value here for somebody right there's gotta be i just don't know who and i don't know if they'll be um you know on that list but i just i don't understand how this is not a movable contract and i hope that um i hope that they fix it because this is a guy that can't be on the roster like if they choose to keep him instead of tory krug i i don't know if i can trust doug armstrong anymore at that point like that's bad. That's terrible management. And I don't, I don't dislike some of the people tweeting this kind of stuff, but we got to stop making salary cap excuses for Doug Armstrong because here's number one. He's signed a couple of horrible contracts that are killing them. Number two is he essentially didn't even try to bring back David Prawn. Like it, there was something like David Prawn got 750000 more dollars. We'll get into that. But we'll get, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll get into Jesus. it. We'll get into it. Here. Some of these moves are just, they're questionable. Like I think, I think Doug Armstrong is the top, what, five or six GM in the league probably, but yeah. some of these recent moves have been tough. Like I know it's harder to, to, to manage a franchise after winning the cup because you got usually contracts to deal with and more interest in players in the open market and, and trying to stay competitive and they have stayed competitive throughout his entire tenure. There's no doubt, but man, some of this stuff is, it just it doesn't make any sense. So um, Doug, Doug Armstrong's his big judgment point is going to be what's going to happen between this season and next, because yeah. that's virtually when the entire forward core is up for a contract renewal. Yeah. So the only forwards that they'll have into 2023-24 right now are Shin Buchnevich, Tarasenko, or not Tarasenko, Sod. Excuse me. Uh, Thomas and uh, Nathan Walker. Uh, Nathan Walker. Yep. Yeah. And you have three RFAs, including Cairo. Mm -hmm. And you'll have UFAs, O'Reilly, Tarasenko, Barbashev, and uh, Nolachari will be a UFA. So big one there. Um, yeah. So that's next summer is going to be very interesting to see how they, how they do that. Cause O'Reilly and Cairo have got to be brought back. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And uh, yeah. So. Uh, I guess we'll move on to uh, Thomas Grice here in a moment. So the Blues uh, signed Thomas Grice. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is – yeah, it's just – it's not – it's not – it's not it's not the right move. Why? <laughs> yeah. he's, he's terrible. I mean, I, I don't even care about, like, the – just think about this. Everybody's saying, oh, well, Hofer's going to be ready soon. Okay. Right. I would almost guarantee right. <laughs> I would almost guarantee that Joel Hofer is not ready enough to be in every like a, a full roster backup next season. Like I don't think that's gonna happen. And if, if it does, you're relying on Bennington even more. So mm -hmm. 
Thomas Grice is a horrible goaltender. I don't, I don't care who, who he's playing with in Detroit. He's going to be 37 this season. You couldn't yeah. get a younger goaltender. Ilya Samsonov is 25 and has a, still has potential, in my opinion. He got mm-hmm. 1.8, so you couldn't have done that. I mean, who? It just it it was mind-numbingly stupid. And Eric Comrie too is way better than Thomas Grice, and he got like 1.8. Three, I believe so, and right. that was two years. But it's like, how hard could it be if you need to get rid of Comrie after next season to just trade his one year contract that you have? So that's well, just and so the, the thing that I don't get the 1.25 million, and then he also gets performance bonuses if he plays more than 20 games. Then, then you look at Alex Stalock, who's 34. He signs a one-year $750,000 deal. Dustin Tokarski, he's 32, signs a seven seventy-five. dollars Why in the world couldn't you have signed one of those guys to anything like that? Like, why, why could you have not signed Thomas Grice to a one-year $750,000 contract and said, here, we're going to be able to put in some performance-laden bonus you know, incentives here for you. If you hit them, great. If you don't, then well, here you go. Thomas Grice I, had I, like a had like an 880 last year and he was horrendous. And he got 1.25. What a complete waste. Complete waste. They're gonna justify that and say, well, look at the year before he had a 270 goal against and a 912 save percentage. Great. That's what they're gonna say. He's, and, he's not good. <laughs> yeah. And in the playoffs here for the Islanders. The year before that, a 2.02 and a 9.29 through four games. One of the best defensive units in front of them with the Islanders. And and you know what? I sincerely hope that Thomas Grice comes into St. Louis and proves all of us wrong. I, I sincerely hope that he proves every single person wrong. And we are looking dumb for how much that we criticize him. Yep. Sincerely hope so. But as of right now, I I almost flipped over my keyboard whenever I saw Thomas Grice signs with St. Louis. I, I couldn't believe it. Now, I understand Lindgren, he wanted the playing time. He wanted, you know, whatever. But Doug Armstrong cannot be that thick-headed to see that he had a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde of Jordan Bennington last season. Jordan Bennington, the beginning of the season, you could not trust him. The end of the season, he he was normal Jordan Bennington. So Charlie Lindgren goes to Washington three years for $1.1 million. I, 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 wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done three years for Lindgren, though. No. And, and again, I get it. It's the playing time. It's, you know, all of this, he probably, he wants to be, you know, a one, a one B situation. He wants to be able to get 30 to 40 some odd games, probably minimum here next season in St. Louis. I don't see how you couldn't give that to him. I, I don't understand it. And again, three years, I get it. You got Joel Hofer who's ready to go. You give Joel Hofer another year or two and then again you hate to be able to say well we're just going to sign the guy to three years because that's what he wants and at the at the end of the day we're just going to trade him here anyway but that's what that that's sports these days just sign him for the three years pay him the 1.1 get a little bit more certainty here out of Lindgren again his five games that he played extremely small sample size he could be a totally different goaltender last year and us looking here at it could say thank god that we did not partake here in this. And, and again, I, I could be way off. I mean, you, who knows? This is just pure speculation here at this point. And, and us just complaining to complain, but boy, 37 years old and 1.25 million for, and, and a guy who, again, last season, 3.66 and an 891 save percentage. No, no, I, nope. And he's 37. I think we would view this yeah. a little bit differently if it was one year, 800 K. That definitely be viewed differently, but 1.25 is absolutely insane. And I know it's not a lot against the cap, but it's enough to, for us to complain about because you're you're pretty much – you need somebody behind Bennington that you can rely on a little bit. And I don't think Grice at 37 years old is somebody you can rely on at all. 
No, and that's and that's my point of, of a guy here like Lindgren who can also push a guy like Bennington for some starts. And I think Armstrong is under the impression that this is a good defensive team, which it's not, where you could throw anybody in there and have success, which it's not. So it's just it's it's insane to me. Um, I don't understand it. It's kind of surprising that they even did it. I feel like because it's like Jesus, he's, his numbers are not good. I know they've been good in the past, but he's getting older. I don't, I don't see anything that tells us he's going to be any good this season. So uh, we'll when, see. When we've got Detroit fans sending yeah. us messages on Twitter and saying "I'm yeah. sorry," like sincere "I'm sorry," I... it's not, it's not ideal. I mean, and I is I tweeted this uh, earlier. I think. I don't know if it was today or yesterday, but let's transition here. Is it is it a bad thing that the Blues' best offseason signing is Nola Chari to this point? Yeah. One year, $1.25 million. Solid, solid fourth liner. Literally their best move. Like This, solid. this yeah. is a very – I didn't mention him when we were talking about fourth line centers, but this – probably because I thought he would maybe be viewed as like a – Bottom six, like could play the third line for certain teams, but one point two five, he's a way more. He'll be way more valuable to the team than Thomas Grice will at one point two five. So I think Achari is no doubt your fourth line center. I think he's he's similar to Bozak, but younger, and um, I guess he didn't have that kind of offensive rise that Bozak had for some of his career. But yeah. but we saw Achari in the Cup final in nineteen, and he played for a very good Florida team last season. So. Uh, I think this is clearly their best move, and I think their second best move is the third thing down here that we have on here. Yeah, Will Bitten, two years, two way contract here worth seven sixty two. That's a good one. I like it. You know, between he Bitten and Lievo, all all three of these depth signings that they've done, very under the radar signings that I I really thoroughly enjoy. Um, you know, we've seen here in the past that the Blues have had huge sparks from some of their depth players, some of these guys that they've called up from the AHL, some of these guys that, you know, you make nothing, you know, out of anything. You know, I mean, again, Charlie Lindgren came up and everybody said, who in the world is Charlie Lindgren? And then all of a sudden, he is old Chucky Sideburns here in St. Louis and everybody loves him. You know, I saw somebody um, here not too long ago growing out the Sideburns here just simply because of him. So... When you get three guys here like this, I mean, who knows who's going to be able to step up? And, um, I mean, the, the Thunderbirds are going to be very good again next season because yeah. uh, Josh Leva was the AHL playoff MVP for the Chicago Wolves. So uh, I think I think he's a guy that, that probably starts uh, on the fourth line on opening night. I think him and Acharya are good bets for that. And if it's not him, it's probably going to be Matthew Highmore who they also signed. I think the big question is if you have a Chari locked in as your fourth line center, and I have to think that Levo or Highmore will be on the wing because Highmore has not played in the AHL in four seasons. And he's played a lot of NHL games with Chicago and Vancouver the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's a very hardworking, a little bit undersized, hardworking player. I think he'd be a good fit for the fourth line. Then it's, Nathan Walker or Clem Costin, I think, would be in Logan Brown. That's three guys right there that would have that third spot. And then who's going to lose their job when Torpchenko's back? So the fourth line is maybe the most interesting thing for the team right now. Do you think, do you think that the Blues, and I don't think it would be a legit shot right away, but because of his shot, Matthew Furk, I saw somebody tweet out when we signed him and – it made me, you know, the, the, the gif where you see it and it's the girl who's looking at something and she's just like, hmm, well, maybe, I don't know. She said of Matthew Furk, I mean, what was it, like 108, 109 miles per hour of a slap shot down in the HL a couple of years ago? I'm sure he's still got something relatively <laughs> that fast. Put him on fourth line minutes and number one top power play unit. Just let him just snipe. Just give, I mean, give him one timers all day long. I know he had forty goals last season. Yeah, fifty six games for the Ontario Reign. Mm-hmm. I believe it's I believe it's Martin Furk, by the way. Martin Furk, uh, thank you. Correct the the people out, for the people out there. But um, 
It kind of just when you see someone with that lethal of a shot, you don't expect them to be accurate. You kind of expect them to be more like Happy Gilmore. But 40 goals is legit at that level. I mean, there's no doubt that he'll get a look, I think. I kind of view this in a similar light. Like when they signed Kyle Clifford, I was like, okay, he's going to play, but I don't know how much. I see that with uh, with Levo, Highmore, and Ferk. I think, like I said, the odd men out in this scenario is just going to make the Thunderbirds even better. So, oh, and yeah. and as we move forward here, they did lose somebody who was playing for the Thunderbirds a little bit to uh, the Canucks. Oh boy, Dakota Joshua. I really like this guy going up. I, I really did. He signed a two-year contract here, $825,000 per season. You look at this and you have to wonder, was it something that had to do with St. Louis? Or was it something where he, he wasn't offered a contract? Was it something where he just wanted to change the scenery? Was, you know, I mean, there, you don't know at this point. But, boy, I really liked what Joshua was bringing here to the table. So, you know, why, why couldn't St. Louis do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i kind of set on not doing two years there. I just think that, like, you have enough depth already. You bring in Achari, that's your fourth-line center. Josh was not going to be the fourth-line center. Logan Brown's still here. Uh, they have a plethora of other centers in the AHL that could do his job. And it's like, if I wanted two years, I assume the Blues weren't going to do two years on that. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that's right or wrong. I mean, you look at what they have coming up or, or guys in the AHL that can be here and, and play. I got to think Nikita Alexandrov is going to be here at some point, and that's a center. Sooner than later. I got to think that um, not maybe not yet for Tanner Dickinson or uh, Kean Washkarak, but uh, they did sign uh, Dylan McLaughlin as well, who's a center, another mm-hmm. depth. He's 27 years old. And they brought in uh, Anthony Angelo, another depth piece for the AHL he's a center or winger he can play both and they have Nathan Todd down there who's 26 Mm -hmm. another center so I feel like they didn't need Joshua and if Joshua can go out and get a two two two-year deal then then why not do it and I think he'll be a good fit for Vancouver probably on their fourth line if he if he's playing so wish the best to him he was solid here but I understand why the Blues didn't do that yeah, and a guy who still, I think, could be able to make a huge push here for next season, and this is just kind of going down the rabbit hole, is um, Sam Annis. And, big, I mean, big time scorer. Uh, and again, you don't know why he hasn't been able to make a push here to the, uh, to, the AH, to the NHL here at this point. You know, we were talking about it here, um, here on our Springfield Thunderbirds podcast, and I, I think he could be able to make a solid push, maybe a good training camp and, and some good solid push here moving down the line, but um, the the Blues have depth. And as I've said before, they have a lot of guys, a lot of guys. They don't have any dudes, if that makes any sense here what at all. Yeah. The, the, the dudes that they have here at this point are going to be, you know, your Jake Neighbors, your Zach Balduk, you know, those guys who are young, up and coming. But the guys who you can insert in the lineup right now, it's just a bunch of just filler guys. I also think Doug Armstrong went out and said, you know what? I'm just going to sign a bunch of one-year players that can play on my fourth line or in the AHL, and I'm not going to commit two years to any of these guys. I think that's another thing that he did, which yeah. was clear with the Joshua thing. So yeah. it makes sense to me. I, I just think that – I think the depth signings were the best signings they've made. Like the Grice signing stunk. The Letty thing was you, you could go either way on it. The four years was a bit ridiculous. But then the Atari deal – yeah, the, the Achari deal, I think, is tremendous. Like, I think right. you get a guy like that with that much experience who's been on good teams before, played in the Stanley Cup final against the Blues, had the infamous – I mean, I think it was a trip and a dive, to be honest. I think it was a trip, but I also yeah. think he sold it pretty well. It didn't ask, work. Ask and people then, in Boston. They might have a different opinion. I would assume they would, but uh, I don't I, – I don't remember who was lifting up the Stanley Cup at the end of that series, so that's kind of weird, but um, – yeah, so I like the Achari deal a lot. So that's what I'll say about that. And yeah. he also uh, had Nick Bugstad, Arizona, one year, 900K. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll Arizona, Arizona is going to have a very big and gritty bottom six, but they're going to be a horrendous team. But maybe they'll be, you know, somewhat fun to watch as they're beating people up because they also got uh, Zach Cassian in there now. So, mm-hmm. very old, very big team that isn't good and has like no skill except for Clayton Keller and. Nick Schmaltz. You know, for them, I mean, as long 
the mentality I, I can see going in here for them right now is to say, you know what, we're going to stink, but we're going to be tough as hell to play against. I had that tweet about what Bill Armstrong is doing there. The Arizona Coyotes have, this is just so stupid. In, in the 2024 and 2025 drafts, the Arizona Coyotes have, uh, let's do the quick math here, 12 picks in the second and third rounds. Holy and if you crap. And if you add that up with the next three drafts, it's 15. They have 15 second and third round picks combined over the next three drafts. They have, listen to this, in, 20, in the 2024 draft, the Arizona Coyotes, as of right now, will have eight picks in the first three rounds. And in 2025, they will have six picks in the first three rounds. And they'll have four picks in the 2023 draft in the first three rounds. So Bill Armstrong pretty much said, you know what, the next three drafts I'm going to make, I'm going to have 18 picks in the first three rounds of the next three drafts. Scorched earth and just I mean, completely just build through the draft, which if we know Bill Armstrong, he's good at that. Strong point. Yeah. That's and he, point. when he sees a player he likes and he does a lot of work on him. And he's like, this is a good fit for me. I don't care who's on the board. That's what he did with Logan Cooley instead of Shane yeah. Wright. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Bill Armstrong knows what he's doing. So, Bugstad, just a nice filler piece there. And that was a guy we talked a lot about being the possible fourth line guy. But you know what? I'll take a Chari at 1.25 1, uh, over Bugstad at 900K. So, yeah. that's how I feel about that. And now we go to the just the worst part of the offseason, probably. Oh, David. We've what already. A- Horrible David, way to go out this time. Yeah. David Perron, two years, 4.75 mil per season. Do you want to start? Because I think <laughs> I I I almost don't want to get into it. Like it's still it's still too surreal to me. 750,000. That's how much his raise was after having a point per game season last season, another productive season this season. His playoffs was as good as he's ever played. And I think what happened here is uh, Doug Armstrong pretty much said, I think we can get the Letty thing done and we're going to close the door on Perron. Because Perron's side of the story is saying that he never even got a, an offer, a formal offer. Mm-hmm. I mean, according to the Twitter spheres you put here, Perron said on 101 ESPN Thursday morning that he was never presented a formal offer to stay with the Blues. And it feels like asking a childhood friend to dinner and never making space for them. So, see, and, the, and then. You know, I keep hearing, I've heard two other things. So obviously I read that here about 101. I didn't listen to it here live, which is fine. I've heard that he was offered the same deal, the two years, 4.75 here earlier in the season. And then I was also, I also heard that he was offered a two-year contract at about three, three, seven, five here, give or take. So he would have to take a slight haircut. That's disrespectful. Um, Correct. And Correct. the other thing is, I would lean towards Prawn side of the story because I don't think the Blues – I think they just chose Letty for some reason. Like, that's pretty much what they did because there's no way that the Blues were going to, like, not offer that contract if they if they had plans to keep Perron. Like, there's no right. way that they – it's 4.75 mil. Mm-hmm. I, I believe Perron side of the story here more – even though he does have an agent that, you know, gets, gets out there a lot, Alan Walsh, he's, he's out there for sure. Um, but I just, it's just, they chose to resign Letty and strengthen their defense, whatever that means, which does Letty move the needle as much in the top four as Perron does in the top six? Probably no. not. No. no. So I just, it's disappointing. It's annoying. It, it, I, we should have expected it. Um, but the fact that it's 4.75, I mean, and and what was up with the the thing saying he wanted three by six? He got four point seven five. I can understand Armstrong saying that he wants to prioritize defense. Yeah, I get but it. Do a pro. Abso- How about he that? Absolutely needed to. And now, if you okay, so let's let's camp here really fast on Provorov. You're Philly. You just had probably one of the worst seasons like in recent history. Some of the worst performances, you know, career lows here for so many different players. They know that every single one of their players are being 
offered at at any single low opportunity. I mean, every single GM is trying to lowball them. Now, to Chuck Fletcher's credit, I don't get the chance to say that much. To Chuck Fletcher's credit, he and his staff, now maybe somebody had to tie him down to not just say accept, they chose and are choosing from what it seems like to go into next season and see what they have hopefully to raise some stock value and then potentially move some of these guys. Because if they had moved a guy like Provorov, the Blues, you know, would have been trying everything possible to exchange out Marco Scandella or anybody else or to that extent. So you don't know what Doug Armstrong was trying to prioritize. So Nick Letty may have been the only best option available at this point. And unfortunately, it does come at the, the expense of a guy like David Perron. I don't like saying it. I don't agree with it. I don't, you know, again, we, we don't know what Armstrong was trying all offseason. You just, you don't know. Because again, it takes two to tango. You know, as much as, you know, I can throw out all the contract offers and, and the trade agreements and, and anything else here uh, until I'm blue in the face. But the other GM has to agree to this. So I, I completely understand and respect the fact that Doug Armstrong wanted to prioritize defense. He absolutely needed to. You had how many 20 goal scores? Eight, nine? Nine. Nine. Nine 20 goal scores. I get it. He is, he was your leading power play goal play make you know this this season with 11 power play goals it's david perron but at some point you have to set aside your emotions and unfortunately it seems like and again this is just pure speculation the cards did not lay the way that doug armstrong wanted them to go and i mean it's just it's good for detroit i think they've had a good off season um yes so they pair this with Andrew Kopp as well as their second line center. So you're going to see Prom with Kopp or Larkin, I would assume. Or if they want to have some fun, Sunquist is a third line center and throw Prawn on there if they want to do that. And then when Fabry's out, throw him on there as well. But, uh, you know, they're they're pretty much the St. Louis Blues 2.0 or whatever you want to call it's it. It's the East St. Louis Red Wings. Because they got what I'm calling five them. of them, right? It's the, Plus Huso. Yep. It's the East St. Louis Red Wings. That's what I'm calling. That's what I'm trying to – get moved so hashtag like it. esl rw i like it um <laughs> but real quick on philly with provorov i think you could just say hey chuck how you doing it's doug armstrong st louis blues we'll offer you a scandal on a seventh provorov and then chuck fletcher be like yes and then be done that's all you gotta do and i think there's people probably like you said tying him down but I still think Chuck Fletcher's an idiot because you literally had Johnny Goudreau wanting to come to you and you wouldn't get rid of James Van Reems. Like you wouldn't give up a first or second round pick in next year's draft to get rid of the JVR contract to sign Johnny Goudreau, who wanted to play for you, mm-hmm. who you could have gotten for probably less. Would the, probably would have taken the hometown discount. Probably would have taken nine or 9.25. I mean, he already took a, he already took a discount going to Columbus. Yeah. I and mean, he left what about $15 million on the table. Yeah. So that Chuck Fletcher's an idiot, dude. I mean, how do you, it's the that's the nature of the business. Like, here's what you're doing. You're essentially trading James Van Reem's that contract and a first or second round pick for Johnny Goudreau. That pick is probably not going to be better than Johnny Goudreau, who had 115 points last season, 90 even strength points, which was the most in the league. He had like 16 more even strength points than Connor McDavid did. And he's not going to have 115 points in Columbus but he's going to be 90 plus. Mm -hmm. So like Chuck Fletcher, I, if I were the owner of the flyers, I would fire him because of that fire him right now. Mm -hmm. Like you have so many big contracts and veterans. You have to try to win. You're not a rebuilding team. You gave Rasmus Ristolainen and Tony D'Angelo, the contracts that you did D'Angelo a little bit more like, Respect just because like wrist line is terrible. D'Angelo is still a good offensive defenseman. Wrist line it sucks. So Chuck Fletcher sucks. And I wish the Blues could trade with him. And I hope Scandella doesn't have Philly on there because I'd love to give give them uh 
give them him. So anyway, that's enough Chuck Fletcher for the episode. People are going to think this is a Flyers podcast and how much we mentioned that moron, but uh, we just need to, we need to almost just have a regular safe um, segment. I like it. Um, yeah. What up Fletcher or something. <laughs> yeah. Cause Philly's been the most wild team this summer and they haven't really yeah. done that much. The, the other thing with them is like, you know, what's going to happen. He's going to get fired and they're going to, the blues are going to bring him in as an advisor, just like they did with Peter Shirelli and, Oh man, you just know that's gonna have Chuck Fletcher's ever within the Blues organization. I'm out. That's just it's that simple. That's how bad that guy is. So um, I suppose we can now move on to uh, the two Twitter polls that I had. Unless you wanted to add anything to this, I think that's it. I don't think we really need to get too terribly much here into it, and we'll kind of go into our quote unquote mailbag segment yeah so i had two twitter polls um the first one was aside from the obvious one who has the worst contract for the blues uh nick letty four by four mil uh 14 percent colton Pareko eight by 6.5 mil 51 percent Braden shin six by 6.5 mil 14 percent and other was 21 percent have to assume other is they didn't understand that the scandela contract is the obvious one mm-hmm. or maybe they're saying like Maybe they're Robert Thomas haters or they're Tory Krug haters or something like that. So, I mean, I think it's obvious that Pareko contract is the worst because of the eight years. There's no way in hell, you can't even convince me of this, that Colton Pareko will be a serviceable defenseman at the age of 35 or 36. I don't see it. Yeah. If he's having back issues already, it's going to be bad. That contract is going to be, you think the Brent Burns contract looked pretty bad or the Eric Carlson contract looked pretty bad? I know the number is not that high in terms of the salary cap hit, especially with what the cap could be in eight years from now, but that's a bad one. That's really bad. When Colton Pareko was offered that contract, I firmly believed that he was going to elevate himself to being a top five defenseman in the entire NHL. That was my opinion of him at that point in time, even up until in around the time frame that Jay Bomeister went down. I firmly believe that he was still elevating his play to a top five. Now, I don't think that Pareko deserves as much flack as what he gets. I don't. And I will be very, very interested in to see what exactly that he looks like, his metrics look like, and every and anything and everything else here under the sun. But boy, oh boy, oh boy, is his contract at eight years here still left. It's just now kicking in. Well, the, the, the bad fuck. thing, the bad thing that I see with Pareko is, and why he gets so much flack on the internet is some of the giveaways are just so horrendously bad yeah. behind the net. Yeah. They're just so bad. And sometimes it just look like, like the Pareko that I remember being great. And this was like right after they won the cup that season and before the pause. Um, just like getting the puck in the D zone and then just going straight through the neutral zone with the puck into the O zone, either shooting it or dumping it in or making a play. That's mm-hmm. the, when Pareko is doing that. And we saw that at times this season, this past season, but he doesn't do it enough. And I still think the back thing's a major issue. Like Armstrong pretty much assumed Pareko would be back to normal last season. And they got him for a quote unquote discount. Because I think if Pareko was playing the way that he played before the Bo Meester incident, he's probably going to get 7.5 or 8 on, on the open market at that point. So, But the Shin thing I just put in there, because Shin, I, his numbers are still good, but I just, I don't know. I just, I, it yeah, could age poorly. A little, little concerned. Shin could potentially be the next Jamie Benn. Shin could also be just like an, a career LTIR guy for like the last two years of that contract. Yeah like a Brent Seabrook or yeah. you yeah. know one of those guys. And then Letty, I just put in there because it's a new thing. And, and right. yeah, so, uh, all right. As currently constructed, how many points does this team get? 13% say 100 to 115, 52% say 90 to 99, and 27% say 80 to 89, 8% say 75, 79. I always thought 90 to 99 is the, the most logical option. Um, yeah. It would take a big season from Bennington and Thomas Christ not being terrible for them to get 100 plus, I think. Yeah, I don't see how they really don't perform anything else other than at least 90. At least 90. I mean, I could definitely see how they could get 89 or fewer, but 90, I think that this team is still top heavy enough 
that they can still score their way out of a lot of games. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on here. Uh, working on a bit of a time constraint, but that's all right. This is a good podcast. We've had a good episode at this point. Um, Twitter stuff at Hig1289. Do you predict Jake the Snake Neighbors makes opening night roster regardless of injuries? My answer to that is yes. Higgs, I'm just going to throw this out there here, buddy. Um, let's not use the snake here with Jake's name. Fair. Just me here personally. Jake the Snake, I think it should be reserved for Jake Allen. Fair. I like just, it. Just me personally. Do I think he's going to make the opening night roster? Oh. I think it's a firm yes with Perron out the door and them not doing anything else. I, I think so. I, I think he'll be in the third line. I want I've got him penciled in yes I don't have a pen mark in that here just as of yet I mean again there could be a couple of other guys that could come in and command it but I I'll, I'll say yes I'm not overly and fully confident but I'll say like 65 percent yes and he also asked what's the latest buzz around chicken I think the latest buzz is there's no buzz other than like Columbus that's about it no, it's quiet, and I still think that the price tag on Chikrin is still fairly high. The, the defenseman thing with the Blues is over. They're not adding yeah. any more defensemen, so no. that's over. Um, we can put that behind us. And then the final thing here is uh, this is from our friends over at the Two Guys, One Cup Blues podcast, Stephen Ground, HockeyRiders.com, and his co-host. Uh, what is the best offer that the Blues can come up with for Matthew Kachuk? They tweeted this, and then this says, assuming it was doable, would you do this to get Matthew Kachuk? Uh, the doable part is Tarasenko waving his no trade for the Flames. Mm-hmm. Tarasenko, Barbashev, Bull Duke, and 2023 first. It's a big offer. It lets Calgary, which he put CAL like he's Elliot Friedman and doing the wrong abbreviation, uh, <laughs> argue they're not rebuilding and protects the Blues' future well. So my answer to this is absolutely yes, I would do this. But the argument against it is – if Kachuk gets to UFA status next season, I don't think there's any doubt he's going to sign in St. Louis, like if the Blues have the cap space. So I think that's kind of the, the only thing here for me. Like I'm 100% down to do that trade. Yeah, I think the Blues would absolutely do this trade just to simply secure Matthew Kachuk in St. Louis. I, I absolutely think that they should. Tarasenko, I mean, again, you're you're always playing with fire, I think, with Tarasenko here right now. I mean, this the shoulder injuries may not be a large concern him for him moving forward, but boy, you just never know here with him at this point. You have no idea what is you going to, you you no idea what you're going to get with Barbashev moving forward. And a prospect is a prospect, whether it's the 2023 first or Zach Balduke. I think Balduke's going to be a potential top six. Um, forward here for St. Louis, at the very least, a good, solid middle six, a very effective forward here for St. Louis. But to really get a guy like Matthew Kachuk here in your lineup in a win now window, I think, I, I don't think how you could not do it. Yeah, I think there's no doubt you got to do it. Uh, let me see if I can find the results of that real quick before we get out of here. Uh, but I suppose we'll talk real quick about what our next episode could be. Uh, we expect to be back within the next week, do another one, talk about if there's any further news, maybe try to get a guest on for next week's episode. That's something we could think about trying to do. Uh, but I mean, we're getting to the point where there's going to be nothing going on, where we're still going to try to produce content on here for you. And another thing I want to say is Jimmy Snuggerud looked fantastic at prospect. Yeah. Camp. Prospect. Camp fantastic. Camp looked good. Yep. So that's promising. Um, I also think the, the get it, letting Perron walk thing was Armstrong saying, I know how to draft Jake neighbors is ready. Here we go. I think that was part of that. Like, I think he's showing, mm-hmm. trying to prove to us, which we already know that, that they know that they know how to draft uh, the, the results on this uh, Kachuk poll were yes. in a heartbeat, 35.5%. Yes, but it hurt 34.5%. No, we're losing too much. 26.5. And no, I don't want Kachuk 3.5. Losing too much? No, you're not, because you're keeping Kairou. That's the key here. You keep Kairou. Thomas is the only untouchable player on this team. Kairou is a close second. So I feel like that's a bit of a weird result, but it's a good result because people want to do it. But It's interesting. And yeah. you have to, I mean, Again, you have to also think about what the price tag for Matthew Kachuk is going to end up being. I mean, you're looking at signing a guy who's probably going to be in around $10 million. Yeah. So if you could have – I mean, 
the pair of Matthew Kachuk and Robert Thomas would be probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $18 million per season. And then throwing Buchnevich on the right wing there, that would be so good to watch. Right. So you'd be just Man. south here of $16 million for that entire line. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see if the Blues are any more active. I think there is some things that they'll be doing in the next couple of weeks. I don't think it's going to be anything too flashy. Um, I'm no. not expecting the Kachuk thing to actually happen. The hope has to be if you're a Blues fan right now, you're hoping for Calgary to go into a rebuild or you're hoping for Kachuk to say, I'm not committing to you guys long term. I'll sign a one year deal or something like that. So that's what you're hoping for if you're a Blues fan. We'll see you within the next week. The Blue Note Podcast, Believe Network. Uh, you can follow my Twitter at Ethan Carter SW. You can follow the podcast Twitter at TBN Pod. You can follow Mike at a new Twitter handle. New Twitter handle, M underscore Meyer3. And we'll see you next time on the Blue Note Podcast.